Hello, this is Doug Gerlach from iClub Central and my iClub. Welcome to our Investment Club webinar. Today is Tuesday, October 17th, 2023. Tonight, our topic is Investment Club Partnership Agreements and Bylaws, creating them, maintaining them, updating them, what you need to know and why you might want to review your existing document if you're a club of long standing. Joining me tonight is Sean Polrang, who's our level two tech support for my iClub and the Investment Club product line. Russell Malley is off tonight, but Sean will be back in the in the back office monitoring uh, questions and comments as they come in. So thanks to him for being with us tonight. As always, this webinar is brought to you by myiclub.com, our investment club operation and accounting platform. We continue to make improvements on the website and thank you for all of your comments and suggestions as we add features and functionality that make it the most popular club website in the world. The handout for tonight's presentation is available in the handouts tab in the GoTo webinar applet so you can download that pdf save it for future reference print it quickly to make notes uh, and you'll also be able to access that when we archive this webinar on our youtube channel the questions box is also there in the application uh, you can type in your questions at any time i'll be monitoring those and do my best to address them as we go through the presentation we'll have time for questions at the end and a break in between but uh, feel free to share your thoughts and comments as we go during our presentation. Now tonight, because we're talking about uh, a different topic, a topic about formation of investment club, I wanted to make a few things clear. We have some caveats, some disclaimers for you. First of all, I am not a lawyer and this presentation does not include legal advice. However, I've been working with investment clubs for more than 30 years and Better Investing has been supporting investment clubs for more than 80 years. And so we have a lot of experience accumulated over that time on uh, uh, how clubs best operate and the uh, issues that clubs address, need to address in their formation, in the legal entities that they choose. Also wanna point out that these, the topic tonight is addressed at better investing style investment clubs and may not be applicable to other types of investing partnerships. Uh, tax and business law often treats investing partnerships differently from business partnerships, so that's an important distinction as well. And as always, check with an attorney or uh, accountant or tax advisor for other questions that you might have. Now, a better investing style investment club, uh, we define as a private group of individuals typically fewer than 30, but they could be somewhat more, somewhat greater, somewhat lesser, uh, but these individuals are pooling their capital together in a common portfolio of securities. Uh, no member is paid or serves as a portfolio investment manager, uh, so no one is receiving compensation from the club, and all of the members have a say in the operations and the decisions uh, that the club uh, makes about its in operations and investments. Um, and they do that in percentage to their ownership in the club. Then the primary focus of Better Investing Style Investment Clubs is investing, not trading, in equities uh, and uh, usually excluding options, commodities, cryptocurrency, precious metals, other arcane types of investments. It, some of these are problematic uh, and some of these tend to be outside the purview of a typical stock investment club. Certainly investment clubs have been recognized and are accepted by the Security and Exchange Commission as well as the IRS as legitimate ways for individuals to invest in equity markets and there are minimal regulatory oversight and filing requirements for this style of club. Now, beyond this, there are often clubs, uh, quote, investment clubs that may be managed by a financial professional uh, as a way of uh, managing capital for friends or colleagues or customers. Um, but that is not the style of investment club that we support. We don't support very large investment clubs, typically greater than 100. Um, this contravenes our, our belief that each member should be involved in the club's operations and management. Um, we don't support 
options, commodities, cryptocurrency, precious metals. Some of these commodities, cryptocurrency, precious metals provide specific challenges to tax preparation and are governed by different laws, so we don't focus on those. And we also don't focus on trading or short selling, and other investment partnerships may certainly do that, uh, but our focus is on long-term oriented stock investing and the educational aspects of investing with friends and colleagues in a common portfolio. Now, I make this uh, caveat and these distinctions because, uh, one, they're often outside the support uh, that our investment club accounting platform provides, and two, they off these can often trigger additional regulatory uh, filings or requirements from on the, both the state and the uh, federal level. So uh, if you're engaged in any of these, you need to be aware of and do your due diligence to understand how your club fits within the, uh, the, the larger regulatory framework. But if you're a traditional better investing style club, again, uh, a dozen or two dozen individuals who come together who are investing in a common portfolio of stocks, then you're all clear. Uh, and this information tonight will be relevant to you. But let's start. A lot of people who want to start an investment club want to understand what's the appropriate way for them to join together um, and why is this partnership entity most often recommended. Well, there are a number of different entities that investing groups could uh, could form at, under. Uh, a general partnership is one of those. Uh, many investing entities are formed as limited partnerships. There are also limited liability companies, LLCs, or limited liability partnerships, LLPs. And finally, there are C or S corporations uh, that group individuals could form for the purposes of investing. We'll talk about these um, one by one, and I'll share some thoughts on them. The general partnership format is one in which all partners share in the ownership, the management, and the liabilities of the club. And this is by far the most common legal entity for investment clubs. It offers the lowest overall costs of operating uh, as an investment club. It provides more than adequate legal protection, in my view, when you follow the suggested partnership agreement that Better Investing or My Eye Club offers. It has very no or very easy to follow and low cost state and local registration procedures and annual renewals. Uh, by and large, most states and most localities don't have uh, strict requirements for general partnerships to file, uh, and that is unlike other forms of legal entities. Uh, and the tax filings are relatively straightforward. And I know when I say that, many treasurers are going, they're plenty complicated enough. Uh, and that is true enough. They're more complex than an individual's typical tax return, but they are less complex uh, than some other entities that uh, you could form as. By comparison, the limited liability company, um, since it was uh, really became popular in the 1980s and 90s, is something that many attorneys advise individuals if you're forming any sort of joint entity, you should form as an LLC. This is a hybrid of general partnership and corporation entity types. Uh, like partnerships, the, it provides pass-through tax treatment. Uh, for most investment clubs, although there are certain LLCs that are treated by the IRS like corporations and have to file according to the corporate tax code. But most LLC investment clubs qualify uh, to receive uh, tax treatment as partnerships. An LLC, the key advantage of that limited liability company is that members are shielded from the debt and the liabilities of the LLC. Uh, however, no passive members are allowed in an LLC, and it is much more costly than a general partnership. All states require an initial registration when you form an LLC, 
there are also typically annual renewals uh, that it must be filed with the Secretary of State along with an annual fee. Uh, you probably require an attorney to draw up your formation documents. That's another cost. And another uh, uh, bit of regulatory paperwork beginning next year in 2024 is that the LLCs must, all LLCs must report to the Treasury Department a new form uh, that is the uh, the reports beneficial ownership information. This is all part of the greater overview of financial systems to prevent money laundering and to ensure uh, that um, uh, entities like LLCs are not being used to hide assets or move assets around. Um, so that's an additional bit of paperwork that LLCs will have to uh, uh, file beginning in the 2024 calendar and tax year. So uh, to summarize, LLCs uh, provide uh, much of the same benefits of general partnerships. Uh, they do provide more uh, uh, protection from debts and liabilities. Um, and I'll talk about uh, how that compares to general partnerships, but all that comes at a significant cost. Now, a limited partnership is uh, like a general partnership uh, in that all partners share an ownership but a limited partnership has two categories of partners, a general partner and the limited partners. The general partners make the decisions and they may be compensated to receive additional shares, um, but, and they are personally liable for the limited partnership's debts and obligations. Now, the limited partners are silent partners. They don't participate in the management of the partnership and their liability only uh, reaches the level that they have invested. So. Uh, once they, they're wiped out, they're wiped out. On the general partner side, if they make bad decisions and end up owing money, then they, the general partners are liable for those debts. As with uh, LLCs, most states require registration and annual filings with their Secretary of State. Again, those are costs. Uh, these would require attorneys to draw up formation documents. Uh, the tax reporting is similar to general partnerships, uh, but this limited partnership format is often used by hedge funds and investing professionals. Uh, and that compensation of partners uh, is one of the criteria if that's used. Uh, in the limited partnership. One of the criteria that will determine if that partnership is subject to SEC regulations uh, regarding offerings of securities. In other words, you can't uh, advertise limited partnership interests unless you're uh, unless you're registered with the SEC. So again, that's a cost, that's an expense, requires legal fees, et cetera. And there are other features that may require limited partnerships to register with the SEC. So this is something that we consider to be a professional level organization. Uh, and uh, it's not uncommon uh, by any stretch of the imagination for uh, a financial professional who might want to offer uh, what we call a hedge fund or managed accounts uh, to be able to uh, enroll their clients in a limited partnership, make the decisions, manage the partnership, uh, hopefully for the benefit of both the general and the limited partners. Uh, we don't uh, have a lot of limited partners who are our customers and we certainly don't cater to their needs. The, and those additional regulatory issues are something they need to be aware of. Now, similar to limited partners uh, and limited liability companies are the Limited Liability Partnership or LLP. You'll, you'll most often come across this used by attorneys and physicians and accountants, other professional service providers who come together in a group uh, it, for tax and regulatory purposes. Uh, these are considered similar to LLCs. Uh, no passive members are allowed. So all of the members or the partners in an LLP are active in the operation management of the entity. Uh, as with LLCs, all states require registration. There's a new renewal, renewal filings with the Secretary of State in your state. Uh, these have costs connected to them. Like an LLC, these are usually drawn up by an attorney and would you would uh, be well advised to consult with an attorney if you decided to to uh, embark on an LLP of any type. Um, and just like with LLCs, 
LLPs are subject to the Treasury Department regulations regarding beneficial ownership uh, beginning next year. So again, um, much less common than LLCs. We typically do, do see investment clubs that form as LLCs, uh, but it's very rare that we see them in that LLP format. The, on the corporation side, the subchapter S or S corporation, uh, this is a corporate entity uh, in order to uh, make that S chapter uh, or subchapter election. The corporation is filed, uh, created and registered as a C corporation. And the C corporation is the, the standard corporate entity uh, that uh, governs both small and mega corporations where you've got a board of directors, you've got uh, annual uh, report uh, requirements, annual meeting requirements, you've got disclosures and uh, legal requirements, you've got shareholders uh, as well as uh, management. Um, so uh, the distinction between a subchapter S is that these are, uh, if you are eligible, you can elect under to be taxed as a partnership, which means that uh, the profits are not taxed at the corporate level. They're passed through to the S uh, corporation shareholders. So uh, they end up being treated like an LLC from a tax and regulatory purpose. Um, they, again, do require registration and renewal filings with Secretary of State and the resulting fees uh, and would almost in, surely be advised to uh, consult with an attorney before forming uh, an S corp chapter corporation. And then that C corporation is the traditional corporate level, as I mentioned. It's got all of the registration costs, the creation costs, the uh, requirements for attorneys uh, and the other considerations. Uh, and so it's, uh, again, not unheard of for an investment operation to form as a C corporation, but uh, it would probably um, only be suitable for uh, uh, a group who has a significant uh, sum that they're looking to invest. And even then, uh, the various general partnership and limited partnership entities would likely be more suitable for them. Uh, but uh, I included here for completeness. Now, often we'll hear about individuals who uh, think it would be really smart of them to create a, a business uh, and then trade in that business, um, make their trades uh, and be taxed as a business instead of as an individual. Uh, and so for that reason, I wanted to just point out that in order to form a general or a limited partnership or an LLC or an LLP, you have to have at least two members or partners. You can't form an investment club with just one member. Um, the subchapter S corporation does allow uh, a single member and the IRS does, um, uh, does define what a trader in securities is for tax purposes. Um, and these individuals can report their income and expenses for business. Uh, IRS code section 475F and IRS publication 550 have more information. If you are, uh, are watching this uh, presentation and uh, with an idea that you're gonna go into business as a trader, uh, those are the, uh, that's where you need to consult. Um, your, it has to be a significant business entity and, and meet the IRS definition uh, in order for that single member entity to be traded, uh, treated from, uh, for tax purposes uh, as a trading business. But that's not the purview. That's not what we uh, support at my iClub with our club software. So let's talk about the, diff the distinction between LLCs and general partnerships. As I mentioned, most the majority of better investing style investment clubs are general partnerships, not LLCs. Uh, the advantages of general partnership is that they are easy and inexpensive to form. There's usually no initial state or local filings. They're easy and inexpensive to maintain. Again, most states and most certainly very few local uh, localities would require annual filings and fees. Uh, brokerage firms and financial institutions will accept a general partnership 
uh, as a legal entity to open an account. Uh, the general partnership format in, in the history of better investing and their experience has proved uh, very successful at providing legal protections for partners. Uh, again, the uh, attorneys often uh, tout the virtues of an LLC as providing uh, ironclad legal protection of me members' assets um, uh, from uh, the activities of the LLC. Uh, but the partnership agreement, as Better Investing has uh, supplied the sample partnership partnership agreement uh, has clubs defining their uh, activities. And so any member who undertakes activities outside the scope of the partnership agreement is acting not as on the behalf of the partnership agreement. Uh, and so uh, it would be very, it, it's, we've never seen a case where, uh, for instance, a member files for bankruptcy and uh, uh, it, their, uh, uh, their debts are being chased through the partnership uh, and uh, to other members. Um, and that's uh, what LLCs often uh, provide that type of protection. Uh, but the nature of an investing partnership, uh, it would be as if um, you know, uh, someone who was a customer of Vanguard or Fidelity uh, went bankrupt, well, uh, the people they owe money to are not going to be able to come through uh, Fidelity and Vanguard to access any funds other than that member's individual uh, accounts there. So uh, those are, that's the, the, the gist of the legal argument uh, for partnerships versus LLCs. Uh, uh, partnerships are much easier to to create since Better Investing and my iClub have support and model agreements that you can review, have uh, experienced volunteers who have been through this process multiple times, who can coach you. Uh, Better Investing has a mentor program. Uh, if you're starting a club where you can get your answers uh, directly from a member of the staff, uh, we support the webinars uh, with, with at my iClub like this that are another avenue of support. Um, and so the there is a, a huge framework of formal and informal support available for the partnership entity and a history of, um, you know, and I, I won't say there's never been a problem, but uh, the the number of problems that I've heard about is practically zero. I can only think of a handful of issues that have ever come up with the general partnership format um, and those uh, involved uh, actions of specific members to defraud the other partners or um, um, uh, people who were just out to, uh, to use the investment club framework as a means of pulling off uh, a heist uh, and uh, stealing money from other people. But those are avoided in the traditional style of investment club where you know the people that you're investing with. It's a private group uh, where members know each other, have relationships, are in a community, can vet uh, the other partners and eliminate that risk. So uh, I think that nature of neighbors and friends and families and coworkers and church members, uh, community members coming together provide you with some additional, additional confidence that support that general partnership format. So let's talk now about the general partnership uh, in summary uh, and start at the beginning, a question that that has come up uh, in the past and kind of continues to pop up is whether this whole concept of an investment club is legal. And uh, the short answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, there's a link here that you can click in the handout uh, to see an article that uh, our club accounting advisor, Russell Malley, put together that, that outlines um, some of the specific, uh, the specific reasons that investment clubs are certainly legal. You can look on the SEC website and you will find information about investment clubs and how to start a club and what to look out for. Um, 
So this is definitely something that has been um, uh, the, a movement that is 80 uh, years or uh, longer in development in the United States um, and continues in the, the 2020s. The partnership agreement, uh, the objective here is to bind partners, but only for the purposes outlined in the agreement. And this written partnership agreement is is uh, is is really important, but in many jurisdictions, an oral agreement uh, could be valid. Uh, many states will recognize an oral agreement, and it would be possible to have an investment club with an oral agreement. It's, it's not advised, uh, as is often the case with an oral agreement. Uh, the recollections of one member uh, or one individual, one partner compared to another may uh, may not be exactly the same, and that can lead to difficulties. Uh, in theory, a partnership format, partnership entity could be used for any legal purpose. <laughs> and for that many matter, uh, it, it's po quite possible that it could be used for an illegal purpose. It would not necessarily make the activities legal, uh, but uh, just as the IRS will tax ill-gotten gains, uh, they could also uh, uh, require uh, taxes from the uh, that are generated through a partnership uh, that's engaged in uh, illegal activities. But for legal activities, many partnerships will invest in securities or in real estate or in operating a business uh, or in owning property. So the partnership format um, is not just for investing, obviously. Uh, clubs are structured as businesses. But we often uh, make a differentiation that uh, a group that is focused on investing uh, within a private setting is not considered to be, quote, doing business. And, you know, it may seem like we're splitting hairs, uh, but there are certainly many uh, local jurisdictions that don't consider an investing group to be a business that has to file with the county clerk, for instance. Uh, whereas if you started a, uh, a painting business, a house painting business under a different name, you would need to make a fictitious name filing or a doing business as filing a DBA. Um, and uh, to that point, the IRS regulations for partnerships often make a distinction between uh, uh, securities as investments versus securities as property. Uh, and so uh, there is sort of a carve out for an investing partnership that is somewhat separate from a business partnership. Although we like to advise clubs that you should operate it as business-like as possible. Uh, so using common sense principles and sound accounting uh, 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 procedures, et cetera. Uh, but uh, uh, that doesn't negate the legality of an investment club uh, by any means. Also, all general partnerships share some uh, requirements uh, that general partners must adhere to uh, specifically regarding fiduciary duties. Uh, the four that are usually cited are the duty of good faith and fairness that partners will operate uh, fairly with each other, the duty of loyalty that you're not going to do something that works against the interests of the partnership, the duty of care that you will undertake with responsibility, the obligations that are assigned or expected of you within the partnership framework, and the duty of disclosure that you're going to let your fellow partners know things that they should know. You're not going to hide secrets or keep secrets uh, from the um, uh, from the other met partners in your partnership. These really are. Uh, you know, sound a lot like the the Boy Scout code, but you know, be truthful, be honest, uh, do good things to others, and good things will happen uh, in your investment club. And when activities of the partnership are conducted according to the provisions in that written partnership agreement, then it really limits the ability of any partner to file suit against another partner or partnership. Uh, and, you know, there's nothing to say that 
anybody can't sue anybody and it happens all the time uh, but if uh, somebody is just unhappy that the partnership lost money if they if the partnership was conducted according to the principles of the partnership agreement um, then that disgruntled member really has no grounds because they were uh, uh, share responsibility for the management of the partnership uh, in my experience uh, my understanding is that if you are, if they, you know, in a partnership situation where, uh, for instance, it might be a limited partnership where uh, the general partners are uh, carrying out fraud, then uh, other general partners might be able to file suit against the partnership or the partners, right? And so, absent that, that legal uh, uh, definition of fraud, then uh, you know, unhappy people will be unhappy. And uh, if you are active in your club and uh, everyone uh, makes votes and you follow the vote and it doesn't work out, it's everyone's, uh, it's everyone's problem. It's everyone takes responsibility and shares responsibility for that decision. So that is what makes that partnership, uh, those partnership provisions uh, work so well for investment clubs as a learn to invest model within your club everyone is going to be sharing those decisions and learning from both the good and the bad choices uh, that the partnership makes for its portfolio now many clubs have a two-pronged approach to documenting their operations and activities uh, with bylaws and a partnership agreement. Collectively, I refer to these as operating documents, uh, whether you have a single partnership agreement or a partnership agreement and supplemental bylaws, uh, together they are the operating documents uh, that will govern how the uh, club operates. Those The rationale for separating in those into two separate documents is that the partnership agreement is a top level uh, document that governs how individuals may join or leave the partnership, what are the investment types that are allowed, what are the key operating principles. For instance, uh, it may say that members will contribute on a monthly basis, uh, the uh, club will meet as determined by the club on a regular basis, uh, and then the bylaws will say monthly uh, member payments are $100 a month, uh, the current meeting schedule is on the second Monday of each month. Uh, the officer roles are president, vice president in charge of education, um, uh, 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 treasurer, secretary, portfolio manager, education officer, et cetera. Uh, and the rationale is that the, that partnership agreement uh, is steadfast and rarely changes, but the bylaws tend to change more frequently over time. It might maybe that you are uh, you decide that you want to increase each member's monthly member payments. Uh, and so having to revise your partnership agreement for that change uh, is rather cumbersome. If you can change it in the bylaws, it applies. Um, and, and by definition, uh, procedural matters that the club votes on at its meetings, if they pass, are subject to, are in effect, uh, uh, addendums to the bylaws. Uh, so those separate bylaws really can help you uh, kind of streamline your uh, your operations. Uh, some clubs will uh, uh, exist, uh, operate with one single partnership agreement that defines everything. And again, the advantage to that is you've only got one document, uh, but um, so you'll need to make a decision uh, which you would prefer. So please feel free to, to uh, add any questions that you might have. I'm going to go ahead and talk about a little bit about creating the club's first partnership agreement. I, I hear from clubs all the time that are, um, you know, I uh, heard from a club uh, last week that's 30 years old. They can't find their original partnership agreement. What do, do they do? Well, uh, in 30 years, they've never looked at that agreement. Uh, I, I suggested it might be time to just start from scratch, create a new agreement that 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 includes how you operate at this point in time uh, and then have all the members sign it. Uh, everyone has to agree. It has to be 100 percent, but at least you uh, can, can use this as an opportunity to codify the conduct that you have been 
operating under. Uh, and uh, whether you can find that original document or not, uh, it, it really is not uh, material. Now, be both Better Investing and My iClub offer sample partnership agreements that new clubs can use to get started. Uh, there are links at the end of the handout uh, that you can uh, access. Uh, on My iClub, we have a club hub that, and an investment club learning center that have sample partnership agreements and bylaws in. Um, that are also in a downloadable Word format that you can modify and customize as your members decide. Uh, decide. Clubs often spend the first couple of meetings going over and reviewing and studying and finalizing uh, their partnership agreement, uh, have questions, someone will come back to, to Better Investing or our My iClub support team and ask for help. What does this mean? Uh, can you explain this a little further? and then come back and modify and finally sign that partnership agreement. Um, there are provisions, again, the sample uh, or model partnership agreements that we provide are there for a reason. And we don't suggest that especially new clubs make willy-nilly lots of changes to those uh, without understanding the full ramifications. Remember, 30, 40, 50 years of experience have gone into those documents. Uh, and so we understand the challenges that clubs face, that new clubs face in particular, and try to provide a framework for future success. Uh, we do, I do, will prevent, present a uh, list of some of my best practices for investment clubs and would suggest that you don't uh, add any provisions that run contrary to those. And we'll look at those uh, on the next slide. Here's the minimum that your partnership agreement should address. The partnership's name and address, the names of all the partners, the effective date, the purpose of the partnership, voting requirements. Again, they may be different uh, when you are adding or, uh, or removing a partner. Uh, versus uh, making decisions about uh, investing or other business, uh, how the profits are shared, what the requirement required contributions of partners are on a you know monthly or annual basis or quarterly, however you want to structure it, how costs are shared, and uh, keep in mind that the IRS says uh, that you should share costs the same as you share profits. Um, uh, unless you specify, specify otherwise in the agreement. In other words, there should be no per member uh, costs that are levied against individuals unless it's defined in the partnership agreement or you're running contrary to IRS regulations. And again, you're opening the door for a disgruntled member to say, I was fleeced, um, the, the, the partnership agreement uh, didn't say anything about costs, and then you charged me um, uh, a higher amount than I was su supposed to have been. Uh, importantly, how members are added, how new members can be uh, brought into the club, how members withdraw, what, what happens to their accounts when they withdraw, and also how the partnership can be dissolved. Um, there will be some other issues and uh, items that you'll include in the partnership agreement, but those are sort of at the minimum. This is my best practices summary. I expect that some of you who've been in clubs for 10, 15, 20, 30 years may find some of these run contrary to your current practice and you may object to them, uh, but these are based on uh, the current uh, environment within the, uh, financial institutions and brokerage firms, tax considerations, uh, and uh, the desire to keep the treasurer's job as simple as possible. Um, so we advise that you don't charge fees on withdrawals above actual costs. So no withdrawal fees, don't charge late fees at all. Members who don't, who pay don't pay or pay late are only hurting, only hurting themselves in the long term. Uh, they don't need to, to make the treasurer do extra work to collect late fees. Don't require equal ownership. It's impossible. Um, you can 
try to finagle it on paper, but it's really impossible. Uh, your club is never going to be equal. Voting should always be by percentage ownership, not for one person, one vote. Uh, but uh, for the purposes of simplicity's sake, you can allow for one person, one vote. Uh, one person, one vote, voting by default with the ability of any member to call for percentage uh, voting uh, on um, any particular matter. And that protects those members who have a higher ownership in the club and should be thus able to exert more influence and control. Don't ever collect fees to cover member expenses. Um, you can end up penalizing uh, members, certain members, uh, if you engage in that practice. Don't ever record expenses by member, only by percentage ownership. Again, you don't want to run afoul of IRS uh, requirements. Uh, only invest in stocks. Again, we want to keep it simple. Let's not be complicated. Uh, no REITs, no ETFs, mutual funds, bonds, commodities, cryptocurrency, limited partnerships, master limited partnerships. Many of these are unsupported in our tax uh, generation software, and many of them will just make the treasurer miserable. So uh, it's possible to build a portfolio of equities, manage your club like an equity mutual fund, and that will uh, allow members to increase include the club in their personal asset allocation mix more conveniently than if you're trying to a scattershot approach. Limit your members to 25 or 30 at the most. Um, that's, a, that's a lot of individuals. Um, um, certainly more than that makes managing the club more difficult. Um, there's a sweet spot and every club will find it. I think a, a max of 20 is often good uh, because your active members are in the you know, 12, 15, uh, 18 range, and that is uh, uh, certainly uh, allows the club to function well. Uh, don't allow member investments to be made at valuations other than monthly. Uh, I'm a big believer in the standard bet investing practice that we value our portfolios once a month, and we don't allow individuals the opportunity to try to game the investment club by watching the valuations on a daily basis and chipping in more money uh, on the days when the valuation goes down and, uh, you know, uh, swing trading the club in effect. And I think that's a very bad practice over the long term. And don't allow trusts or corporations as members. And this will prevent you from running afoul of the ability to, of the IRS uh, regulations regarding uh, in audit of partnerships. And if you have uh, trusts or corporations, it opens you up to practices in case of a, uh, an IRS audit that are more beneficial to the IRS than to the investment club. So once you've uh, satisfied, your, all the members are satisfied and agree, you can sign that partnership agreement. In case of an online or geographically dispersed club, uh, as are becoming more popular, members may simply sign a separate copy of the partnership agreement or the signature page of the agreement, which they provide to the officers of the club. Uh, and then uh, one of your officers will keep the original agreement and all of the signature pages together in a safe location, maybe make some copies uh, that are shared for official purposes. Often your brokerage firm may require a copy of that partnership. Uh, most states and localities don't require general partners to file, but I can't say with absolute certainty that that is the case with it for all 50 states in the District of Columbia. Uh, but our, the vast, we've never heard of anyone um, um, uh, running afoul of that. There are some states that do require some additional uh, annual requirements from general partnerships. Some states like California kind of cracking down on partnerships and have some rules that might affect them. Some localities may require business filings. And again, there's no way to say uh, whether one county clerk or town clerk's uh, office requires an investing partnership or an investment club to file. Um, and so it may be something that you need to check. Um, most nearly uh, every town or county clerk, depending on your jurisdiction, will require a business to file 
if they are doing business as uh, under a name other than the name of the person. So if you're John Joe Smith and uh, you are uh, Joe Smith d offering house painting, um, you may not need to file, but if you are um, uh, Better House Painting Incorporated uh, or Better House Painting um, uh, uh, House Painters, uh, for lack of a better name, uh, you may need to make that filing so that anybody who sees uh, that business in your town will be able to find out who actually operates under that that uh, fictitious name, that business name, right? That's the purpose of a D DBA or fictitious, fictitious name filing. And because most investment clubs are operating under a fictitious name, they may be required to. Uh, but again, you really have to check and um, often I hear of uh, clubs that that never made a filing and nobody ever said anything about them they didn't know and um, you know uh, it was it's never been a problem the the downside is it, if uh, it comes up then you have to make that filing uh, in you know it might be 15 20 75 dollars on a one-time basis uh, again I'm not aware of states that require general partnerships to file it and again investment clubs sometimes get a carve out um, uh, or an investing partnership uh, because it's not a real quote business, uh, but again, something you want to, want to confirm with the state. Uh, and uh, as always, be, you might search for investment clubs and find nothing or investing partnership, uh, but there are some states like Illinois that uh, have rules regarding general partnerships, but they specifically ex exclude investment clubs. That's a great, you know, that I wish all the states were like that, uh, but um, that's something for you to, um, to to take under consideration. Many brokerage firms will require a copy of the partnership agreement. That's becoming more and more and more um, uh, popular. Uh, so uh, that, that practice is something you might need to look at. Um, a couple of more advanced partnership agreement provisions, and again, you can uh, download the handout and copy this. Uh, Russell Malley's club uh, in California has two attorneys who are members, so their contribution to their club was, let's have a, a, an article on dispute resolution that will call for mediation uh, and then if that doesn't work for arbitration uh, instead of uh, suing each other. And his club is very close knit, a lot of family members, but uh, we thought this was an interesting idea and this is something that you might investigate. <clears throat> In terms of the statutes under your state, what's that code? that um, your state um, uh, operates under in terms of uh, dispute resolution. Uh, so that's something I'm throwing out there for you to look at. It's not in the sample partnership agreement. Uh, and then this is in the sample partnership agreement. Um, this is related to the IRS's centralized audit regime, which is uh, probably five years old at this point. The IRS switched up its rules regarding the audits uh, that it may conduct on a partnership's books. Uh, the upshot of it is that um, in the past, the IRS um, um, would only contact the um, um, uh, would only contact the the partnership's representative. Uh, if it had questions about taxes uh, or the the uh, the uh, partnerships uh, finances, they changed that rule and said no. Now, if we have questions about a partnership's uh, finances, we can talk to anybody in your partnership, any general partner, uh, and uh, uh, so this obviously kind of throws the ball into uh, into their court, but they they allowed you to opt out of that provision if you qualify. And if you thus qualify, then um, the, the, the IRS would talk to uh, the, um, uh, the partnership representative. Uh, in addition, this uh, audit framework will um, uh, allows the IRS to levy penalties on the current 
partners for sins of the past partner by default. So uh, if the IRS finds something six years ago that was a problem and wants to levy penalties and uh, taxes, uh, the current members would be liable for it. If you opt out of this, then uh, the IRS would have to go back to the partners uh, at the time of the infraction or underpayment uh, or underreporting uh, and collect it from them. So we, we suggest that clubs uh, definitely do the opt out. In order to do that, however, you can have trusts uh, in your investment club. So if you're able to, um, we, we advise that you opt out and you can include this in your, uh, your partnership agreement. Um, and you can search on our YouTube channel for uh, audit requirements uh, where we look at this, address this in more detail. Uh, so another question that frequently comes up is, uh, when do we need to update the partnership agreement? How do we update the partnership agreement? Uh, what do we what what are the terms of uh, revising uh, your partnership agreement? And technically, anytime a member leaves or joins the club, the partnership changes. it's a it's a new partnership because the makeup has changed. Uh, incoming members, uh, may sign the original agreement, and that's often the case, especially for a newer club. Um, and they just add a space uh, or add additional pages that have signatures. Uh, they could be a separate signature page that uh, uh, is attached to the original uh, that uh, members uh, are agreeing to uh, when they join the partnership. You might uh, also on that original document, cross out the departing partners and um, you know just note that they departed and what the date of their departure was. Um, that's pretty straightforward. But it's also a good idea to conduct a periodic review every every several years, perhaps. You might want to look at your partnership agreement and make sure that uh, your policies and procedures haven't shifted in perhaps contrary ways. Not necessarily a problem, but something you definitely want to include in revisions uh, to the partnership agreement uh, that will uh, make sure that in the future you don't run into any problems. Uh, so, uh, and also as our best practices ha have evolved as they have over the last decade and their new rules like the IRS audit uh, regime rules, their new rules regarding um, uh, uh, tax rates and, and um, uh, capital gains and uh, qualifying dividends, there are all sorts of tax law changes that might dis make you uh, change up the way that uh, and the al allowable investments uh, perhaps that are included. So all that uh, new information that comes to the light is, are potentially items that you might consider in revising your partnership agreement. Um, and uh, the appropriate way is to uh, add an amendment like the following, a some text like the following um, that is at the top of the amended partnership agreement that says this amended agreement of partnership made and include the date by and between the underside, then the text of the partnership agreement, including the original date of formation, uh, and all partners have to, of course, sign that revised agreement. Uh, in general, refiling the partnership agreement, if you are in a jurisdiction that requires it, isn't required. Never heard of this as well, but again, you might need to check the requirements. Um, many brokerage firms now are requiring that they maintain a list of all active partners. So you may need to provide them with a copy of the or a revised partnership agreement whenever it is made. My sense is that many of these uh, brokers that are requiring copies of the partnership agreement never look at them. It goes into a file somewhere and uh, uh, at least they can say that they, they had it and uh, they have that documentation that helps them comply with the know your customer laws uh, that have be, been evolving over the last uh, 10 years. So with that, uh, Robin asks if digital signatures are allowed. Um, um, and uh, my sense is, again, not a lawyer, but uh, I, I would be comfortable 
with dig digital signatures and with emailing signed copies in a secure format if possible um, uh, when, when necessary. Uh, and certainly uh, if you had access to DocuSign or something like that and you could document it, I think that would be, uh, that would be acceptable. Jimmy says, I thought there was an IRS reason for voting to be one person, one vote and not by percentage ownership. Uh, can you go into that a little more? No, actually, that's the the, the reverse of it is. The IRS says that um, that your voting should be in proportion to ownership. Uh, that's the expectation. And certainly um, the uh, the the stated expectation in the IRS publication uh, on partnerships is that expenses are handled uh, uh, according to percentage ownership. So voting expenses, uh, both controlled by the percentage ownership. The one person, one vote rule, uh, rule of thumb, uh, more than anything else is, it, makes it easy in a club meeting. Um, the reason that clubs like one person, one vote, well, there are two reasons. The one reason they like it is it's easy to tally up um, one person, one vote, as opposed to adding up the ownership percentage of all of the members who voted in each way during the meeting. Um, you know, I mean, it, it's easy in a spreadsheet. Somebody can do it as you're going along uh, using the member status report, uh, but it definitely adds a level of complication. Uh, one person, one vote is easy. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, pass, uh, seven, yes, three, no, the motion carries, right? That's easy. Um, so the hybrid method is allowing that one person, one vote. But if you've got a member, who, you know, a group of uh, senior members who've been in the club for a long time and collectively they might own 30 or 40 percent in total of the uh, of the club's um, capital uh, they should be given the right to express um, their uh, their preferences according to that ownership level uh, and often those members who've contributed more uh, have more experience in the club and perhaps should be given uh, that that the benefit of additional uh, voting weight. Uh, and the counter argument to that is if you don't like it, then you contribute more money and then you can carry more weight within the club. Uh, there's no such thing as an equal club where everyone is ownership levels are gonna be exactly the same. Uh, and even if you start out that way, if members leave and uh, other members join, you're not gonna be able to maintain that equal ownership. So uh, that's the thinking behind that. And certainly no corporation in America, uh, there are corporations that have different classes of, sh of stock, right? Class A, class B, class C, where class A might be uh, the original founders and they have uh, they have uh, uh, more voting rights, for instance, uh, and then the Class B or Class C shareholders may have fewer voting rights or no voting rights. In terms of Google, um, they have um, two classes. One is a non-voting class uh, and the other is a voting class. Um, um, and so uh, you would never find the situation where, um, uh, you know, where where a corporation with with a single share class would uh, would allow each shareholder to have one share. No, you vote according to the number of shares you own, and the principle is same for investment clubs. <clears throat> yeah, uh, let's see. Jesse comments that it's my understanding from a prior tax webinar that if we want to record expenses by member. Uh, then it needs to be spelled out in the partnership agreement. And yes, if you want to charge expenses equally by member, it has to be expressly uh, uh, agreed to in the partnership agreement. Uh, and the, uh, you know, again, the argument against that is that um, uh, you would not divide up your profits equally per, per member. You would profits are divided up by percentage ownership. And so uh, in our best practices recommendation, expenses and profits are shared according to percentage ownership. And people get antsy because they feel like, well, you know, uh, 
if we join Better Investing, everybody gets the magazine. Um, so why should one member pay $80 and another member pays $40? Well, if the $80 person who's paying $80 is spending, uh, owns twice as much as the person paying $40. So you're both paying the same percentage. Uh, and, um, you know, so, but people sometimes object to that. Um, and if that's the case, then you just keep those, those types of expenses off the books uh, and uh, have them handled on an individual basis. Um, as we've uh, talked about, we have did a webinar on expenses where you can look at that on the, uh, and find the possible solutions for it. Uh, Jimmy says, why is only one valuation date recommended for all member contributions? This is a, the practice of better investing and investment clubs. Um, since the modern day investment club movement started in the 1950s, uh, where uh, the clubs met once a month, uh, prior to that meeting, the treasurer would prepare the valuation statement and the member status report for the club for that month. Everyone who paid their dues, their member payments at that month, were able to purchase shares at that monthly valuation. Uh, and uh, so at the end of the year, you would have had 12 monthly valuations. Then you would have wrapped up the year with a year end valuation and said, this is, you know, so you would know where you started at the end of the prior year, where you ended up the year. And you could kind of quickly see how much the unit value uh, increased uh, over the course of that year. Um, there have been some uh, some people like the idea that members will send in their check at any time during the month or make an electronic payment at any time during the month. Uh, and if they pay early or if they pay late, they shouldn't receive the opportunity to buy units at the um, the next or the last um, the last uh, meeting valuation. And uh, again, I think that just complicates things because now you've got transactions coming and happening uh, all during the month. You've got dividends that are being recorded on a particular date. And so the member who um, uh, purchased, who, who made a member payment the day before the dividends doesn't get the benefit of that dividend. The member who paid after the next day gets the benefit of the dividend, right? And so you have all sorts of unfairness that uh, are able to be exploited by some members uh, who might be on the ball. Uh, and over time, they're eking out, you know, minor gains at the expense of other members. Um, so if you have, uh, if you follow my recommendation, which is one valuation a month, uh, and then all of the, the buys and sells and income and expenses get recorded as of that date, all member payments that come in on or after that date uh, get the benefit of all those prior um, uh, income, expense, uh, um, uh, uh, profit loss items, and um, uh, uh, all the way up until the next meeting. And so uh, there's no opportunity uh, for those uh, little discrepancies that over time can add up to much larger imbalances between particular members. So that's my take on it. All right, well, I wanna thank you for some great questions there, remind you about our suite of tools from iClub Central, uh, the parent of my iClub uh, that can help you as an individual member with your investment decision-making. And um, here are the promo codes. Uh, if you wanna try our small cap newsletter and our investor advisory service multi-cap newsletter, both of them have track records of outperforming the uh, small cap index and or the broader market over the last decade, uh, 20, 30 years. So um, they are uh, time tested, uh, affordable, and uh, we urge you to check them out if you're looking for more stock advice. Thank you to Sean in the back office for helping out tonight. Thank you for stopping by our webinar. We'll look forward to seeing you next month at our next My iClub Investment Club webinar. Thanks again. Have a great, uh, a great rest of uh, October, and we'll see you in November.